Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me, uh, Mr. Cannons, Mr. Leventhal? We can't hear you all. I know. Can you hear us now? Yes. Um, yes. Is Alexandra helping you? Is that who? Yes, Alexandra. Okay. All right. I'll let her into the room as well then. Um, it looks like on Mr. Leventhal's screen, we just see a blank box. We don't see Mr. Giuliani in it. Should be right there. Okay. I'm here. I hear you. We just don't see you. Oh, wait. Okay, hold on. I know I have to do it. Uh, we're, we're just working on that. Right now. Now. <laughs> Sorry. And Mr. Leventhal is uh, uh, off camera, but he is present as well. Oh, we see you both on the screen. Oh, we see Mr. Giuliani now. Thank you. All right, good morning again, everybody. Um, anything, uh, anything, well, does anyone have anything to talk about before I start? Not me. Not from us. Okay. Let me review the bidding here. Uh, last Thursday, which I think was December, Eighth, um, we finished testimony, closed the uh, closed the record on testimony, and uh, had oral argument um, uh, for an extensive period of time. Um, after that argument, the the hearing committee uh, convened an executive session to uh, basically to deliberate to see whether or not um, we could decide whether. Uh, uh, Disciplinary Council has proved at least one violation, make a preliminary non-binding finding to that effect. We said, I think we told the parties that we would issue an order on, uh, on this past Tuesday. Um, the next day, uh, we, had, we received a statement from the respondent um, who referred to some of the discussions, the colloquy at the, uh, at the oral argument and uh, offered to... Um, to put the respondent back on the stand to, to testify further about some of his pre-litigation uh, pre investigation, namely testimony describing interviews he conducted in preparation of that litigation. Um, disciplinary counsel has um, opposed that because it's, uh, it's, it's a fairly, um, a regular procedure and not contemplated by the rules and um, doesn't really think that respondent should have an opportunity to uh, to testify about matters that he already testified about. Um, that that argument has um, has some appeal, but under the circumstances, since although we had we had talked about our decision for an extensive period of time, we didn't we didn't uh, we didn't issue our final uh, order on it. And um, under those circumstances, I think that it's appropriate for um, respondent to testify about the matters that he wants to testify about. Uh, it's not going to hurt anybody. And I think it it is not only fair, but, but lends the appearance of fairness to this proceeding. So we will allow Mr. Uh, Giuliani's limited testimony on the topic that his um, his attorneys have said that he wants to testify about. But since we're opening the reopening the uh, the hearing, I wanted to raise another point with the parties, and that is with respect to the uh, the written exhibits that have been filed. Uh, looking through them, I saw some exhibits from the docket in the district court litigation in Pennsylvania, but I did not see the briefs and memos that were filed in connection with the motion to dismiss. Memos in support of it, and I assume there were more than one, maybe not, and memos in opposition um, to the motion to dismiss. Now, I, I think that uh, I could properly, we could properly take, properly take judicial notice of the content of those memos, but I would I would ask if uh, if there's no objection from the parties that uh, disciplinary counsel um, supplement the record by filing 
just the memos in filed in the district court in connection with the motion to dismiss. Is there any uh, is there any uh, problem with that? We we have no objection. I, I don't think there's any problem other than the logistical one of locating them. Uh, I will say that there were lots of parties who intervened in at the in the district court. Um, so there may be lots of pleadings um, uh, that are uh, compliant with uh, with your request. Uh, but uh, what I suggest that we'll do is after we conclude the proceedings today, over the next day or so, we will endeavor to put our arms around those, uh, show them to respond as counsel, um, get an agreement that we've we've gotten the universe of uh, of uh, stuff, and then submit it to you. If that if that. Okay. I, I, thank you. I. <clears throat> There could be, a, I guess there could be a ton of stuff on this, and um, uh, I'm not, I certainly don't think that it's worthwhile um, if there are amicus briefs filed, I, you know, it's just it's just parties or people that were um, uh, intervened as parties, and hopefully multiple parties filed a, filed a joint brief. I would have thought that under the circumstances, they would have tried to do that. I, I, I think there's some of that, but my recollection and maybe I'm wrong about this, was that there were lots of briefs filed, but maybe we can restrict it to the, we'll, we'll, we'll try to figure out a way to agree among ourselves uh, to okay. restrict it to the say of the parties or something like that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anything else before we start with the evidence? Nothing from us. Okay. Uh, Mr. Kamins, you may call your witness. Yes. Uh... <laughs> Right, Mr. Giuliani, I remind you that you're still under oath. So, Mr. Giuliani, pursuant to the understanding of the, and the order, I want to focus uh, on you on any steps you took to investigate the information provided to you concerning the 2020 presidential election in Pennsylvania. Now, you told us last week that after the election, you went to Philadelphia on November 4th. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. And you told us that you went to the convention center. My, my best recollection is that after some debate on our trip up there, that's where we decided it was the best place for us to go first. Okay. And at that point, when you went to the center, did you take any steps at that point to begin any investigation? Among other things, yes. But I say that because we were probably, I and my colleagues were probably doing what you could describe as 10 different things, one of which was uh, witnesses telling me what they had observed or sometimes saying, who can I tell it to? Okay, now this is at the center, correct? So uh, at the center, my main purpose was to be there to aid Corey Lewandowski and Pam Bondi because they had they were in that in, in the state in some stage of what Corey described of getting the order to see the ballots reversed and the sheriff had already denied them. I had been informed of that by a sheriff's underling and also by several NYP NYPD oh my goodness uh, Pennsylvania uh, Philadelphia police officers and who I, I told you I'm very close to that, have over the years done many cases with them. They were involved in our mafia cases in the 80s. So let's just focus on what so, so, so I, I felt very comfortable asking them, hey guys, what, what's going on? Here? Right. Because Corey told me a, uh, an incredible st story uh, that he showed the sheriff the order. He Honestly, I didn't exactly know what he was describing to me. Uh, it sounded a little strange that he would have an order to allow him to be within striking distance of the of the documents. Uh, the sheriff it. would refuse to enforce it. So I said, "What's going on here?" And he said, "They're acting." Um, he used very foul language, and he said, "They're acting like." Um, I'm trying to find a nice way to put it. Uh, 
they're acting like they're uh, um, basically adjuncts of the, of the uh, Democrat Party. Now, if I can focus you just... That's a, a nice way. All right, so if I can focus you more on your efforts to investigate uh, the information that was coming in at that point, uh, were any of the people at the convention center uh, asked to sign any documents? The people at the convention center were going into anywhere from highly generalized, very uh, conclusory statements to extraordinarily detailed statements. Something like, I've been shut out all day and been pushed around like I'm a pig. And, was they, and were they talking to you? Were they talking, I, to, were they talking to you? Among others. Okay. I, I was sort of a, they recognized my face and when they saw my face, they flocked toward me as the repository, I guess, of all these complaints that they had all day. Uh, then some of them were giving me extraordinary detailed information. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I got here exactly when I was supposed to with two. They wouldn't let me, they wouldn't let me look at a single ballot, but I that didn't stop me. I kept a record. I kept a record. See, see here, I kept a record of every single ballot they stuck in. And in two hours, they put in 27 ballots. Oh, and by the way, at such and such a time, I saw them tear up two ballots. And I've done this for years, and I, you're not allowed to tear up ballots. All right, did you take any steps so, to document so, this information? The, state, the statements were on a, a continuum of so general they wouldn't be particularly useful, except in a litigation, except for flavor to, God, it could have been very useful. So very shortly, I, I think I might have written the first one or two down, realized this was very counterproductive, and called over either Mike Roman, who uh, had given me a briefing on the day, or when I couldn't get Mike, Dr. Ryan, and I said, would you corral these people? Would you get, uh, see if you can get their statements? And um, maybe we can't get them notarized or signed to them, we get them we can get them written up and then we can get back to them and just make some sense out of this. Okay. And now you testified also last week that by the 5th, November 5th, you had gone to campaign headquarters. Yeah, almost can do it, right? Our, our original intent was to go to campaign headquarters. <clears throat> we thought we could get a more uh, uh, calmer mm -hmm. description of what happened there than in the middle of, you know, it looked like, I'm not going to say it was violent, but it had a little element like it was on the verge of possible violence. There was a lot of yelling and I don't mean to make a joke. It was like a Philadelphia Eagles football game, um, but it, it had, um, let's say it wasn't the best place to take statements. Okay. So at some, uh, point, so at some point, did, did you, uh, at headquarters personally interview any people people who had information about the election. Yeah, I should say so we get the testimony in the right, you know, in the right order. Despite the fact that this was chaotic and despite the fact that five other things were going on, and I was getting telephone calls about other cases, I did have managed to have a fairly coherent conversation with Mr. Mercy. Uh, who sort of helped me in the sense that he was saying, here's what they want to tell you. Yeah. So he put it in categories. He put it in categories for, uh, for me. And then, uh, and then I, not as strongly, but more faintly recall someone else helping him. And I do believe that was Mr. Queter, meaning to say, when he wasn't here, I was here. And I continued the watch because what, what Mercer had set up in lieu of being able to see any ballots, which he was very angry about because he claimed that every year he did this, he was always able to see ballots. And Democrats never gave him trouble on this before. He set up a watch. And the watch was, um, he designated certain people, Queer being his number two, to set up another group of people that counted ballots that they should have, under the law, been able to observe. And I should say, it wasn't just, from their point of view, it wasn't just the law. They really didn't know what the statute said. 
whether the statute said present, where you can observe, where you can look at it, where you can touch it. They were most of these people were anywhere from five to 25 year inspectors. So they were relying on prior practice. And the reason they were in a state of shock was this was so different than prior practice. Now, other than they came in that morning fully expecting to sit down, they knew it was going to take forever. Because they knew how many, and they were prepared. They even brought extra pairs of glasses. And uh, they sat, they were going to sit down. And some Democrat was going to be on one side, some Republicans be on the other side. The, the public official was going to be in the middle. He was going to take the envelope out. He was going to show them the envelope. They're going to check the signature on it. They're going to open it up. Mr. Cavins, so, I, the, the witness is um, testifying about things that clearly has no first-hand knowledge. Uh, I'm, trying, I'm trying to uh, get this. This is here, here today. Well, I, I'm trying to... Uh, uh, I'll, I'll get to the issue at hand, Mr. Uh, Bernie. Thank, thank you. Yeah, Mr. Giuliani, other than Mr. Queter and Mr. Mercer, did you personally interview other people yes. who had information about the election? Yes. Other and, about, and about how many people, about approximately, how many other people did you personally interview? Uh, no, uh, more than one. Uh, more than four or five, less than 10. And some of them would be uh, um, brief interviews, like in the middle of a conversation, one of them would, I'm looking at some of the names here to try to remind myself, because I remember some of these names, someone would break in and say, yes, that happened to me too, that kind of thing. And then when that would happen, I would do the best that I could not to lose them and turn them over to Maria, to um, to uh, 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 Mike, uh, I also had met at this point. No, I'm sorry. It was later that I did that with Linda, but I eventually did it with Linda Kearns too. All right. So you're saying it was, it was Linda Kearns, his deputy, or his name. I put, uh, now, when you conducted these interviews personally, did you focus on any particular issue when interviewing interviewing them? Well, it, it, I, yeah, they sort of focused me on what I had been hearing, as I said, coming there. And I had already had a conversation with Ken Starr, I believe, about uh, uh, the idea of a consolidated lawsuit. So I thought that my value here for my little team was not going to be to help um, Hicks with his, what he was doing, because I had already been told by a number of people coming up there what a good lawyer Hicks was and that we could really trust him to put this thing together. So what issue did you focus uh, on? The, the failure to, the, what I would call systemic, massive failure to observe. And did, did that issue fit in with any legal issue you were working on? Sure, it fit in, first of all, it was similar to the information or evidence I was getting from four or five other jurisdictions, almost to a T. Uh, in fact, at times it was confusing, and it's confusing in my memory to separate that. I, I can get Michigan and, and something said to me in Philadelphia confused. Um, so it was hitting me that this was all very, very good material if we were going to do eventual consolidation, and I wanted that preserved as best I could. I was assuming that Hicks, Kearns, Hicks's assistant, and Kearns assistant were handling the Philadelphia part adequately because I had been told they were very good. I also had assured myself, hadn't met her yet, but that we had a very good attorney in Pittsburgh um, because during the course of that short time I was there, we had their meeting in charge, we had already run into some pretty bad attorneys. Now, did you also make any decisions on rejecting information that you were receiving? Well, there was one man who was all over me, very impressive man, uh, who had a very, very long, long story of what ha happened to him, which I wouldn't even bother you with, a uh, quite credible long story of what ha happened to him. Um, and it was so good that I said to him, you know, we, I can't really follow this now, but come over to the campaign headquarters, which he knew, and maybe I can have five minutes alone with you. 
Um, so then I think this would be a good point to, to say, you know, we were finished at the, at, at the convention center and we decided that we would go to the, that we would go to the campaign headquarters, gather all the information we had. That means myself and my team that I told you about at that point, um, uh, Eric Trump Jr. had shown up and he had information that he had been gathering all day. Um, Corey had other people in other parts of the state that he had either coming to the campaign headquarters or calling in. So we were going to all meet at the campaign headquarters and see what's the sum and substance of the evidence we had at that point. All right. And then in the next few days going forward, did you make decisions of, about rejecting any of the information? Yeah, the man, the man I told you about toward the end. Other than the person you were talking about before, were there other people? No, I rejected, I rejected, and uh, I don't know, it's hard to say how many. Uh, that, that's, that one I rejected because um, it was a great story, and I, I gave it to Dr. Ryan, and she didn't want to bother Bernie with it because Bernie was overwhelmed, so she did her own background check. <laughs> she said, you're going to have a tough time with this guy. Other than that, he's got a that, record as long as you're on. Other than that, we got, rid of, we got rid of him. Were there other individuals who you? Yeah, we had a person that claimed to be an observer that we could prove wasn't there. Uh, we had a person claiming to be a, 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 a Republican observer who was a Demo who was a Democrat observer who either was trying to set us up or was bitter because he had been fired by the Democrats. Um, so I'd say, I don't know, I, I can distinctly remember throwing out 15 <clears throat> that you could attribute to Philadelphia. I could be a little wrong because at the same time, I wasn't reviewing them just Phil. I was reviewing, you know, Minneapolis with Philadelphia was, well, let's, Atlanta. Stick, to, let's stick to Pennsylvania. But I guess the point that I'd like to make for the panel is it would be unfair if you think we just took every piece of crap that we got. We threw a lot of stuff out. So is it fair to say that you were vetting the information that was, you personally were vetting much of the information that was coming in? Yeah, and I was assuming it was being vetted and asking on the way up to me. So sometimes I'd be a little surprised that such a, such a bad one would get that far up. Right. Um, now, when you testified last week, you did not mention uh, these personal interviews, correct? That you conducted. I don't. I, no, I don't believe I did. And, and was there a reason why you didn't? Didn't come up, and I, I you know, there's only a certain amount of time you have. I didn't know how relevant they would be. I, I thought, if I, I mean, my thinking was, we had so many affidavits that I submitted. And I think I testified. I read them all, and I thought that would satisfy the the, the court that I had more than sufficient uh, uh, factual basis for the, the, the panel. panel. No, sorry, the panel. I mean, I, I read, I did read through the affidavits all of them twice before I testified. And it seemed to me that we had supplied um, almost in duplicate, triplicate, whatever, an enormous amount of support for the allegations that we had made and that that wasn't going to be a, an issue of personal vetting. But when that came up, I felt sort of unfair because I felt wouldn't be fair if they thought I didn't, I didn't do some personal vetting because I'd always do in my lawsuit. Even if I can only do just a little bit, I, I used to train my lawyers that you got, you got to go, <laughs> you've got to go to the bank to observe the bank robbery if you want to try a bank robbery because there could be a pillar in the way that nobody remembers. Uh, and then you've got to get your hands dirty and you've got to talk to the people you're relying on. It gives you things that you otherwise wouldn't get. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't want them to think that because this was truncated, I didn't do that. It, it kind of worked out that I was able to do it because I could do it for a different purpose here, which is that overall lawsuit but it got me into i'm looking at this well, list. Now, now you mentioned it. about 15 of these people who and then again i got to and i'm also trying hard and i will confess i may have confused one or two because some of these people came back up again 
when we did the Gettysburg here. Now, you mentioned uh, a few people by name, Mr. Quija, Mr. Mercer. Do you recall any other names of individuals you personally? Yeah, I spent, a, I spent a lot of time with, uh, with, um, with uh, Catherine. Um, do you remember her last name? Um, of course I do. <laughs> Catherine, I can't remember her last name. <laughs> what? Uh, any other Catherine, name? Catherine was in charge of Pittsburgh for us. Catherine had from the very beginning, uh, this is how I remember it most, a great reluctance to testify, but an extraordinary amount of information. And, right. and, uh, the, and even, even at the point of the art argument, the oral argument that I made on the chance that we were going to have a hearing, that Judge Grant would give us a hearing, I was reserving my right to use every amount of skill that I have in persuading mafia people to testify again we together to testify would it refresh your recollection to review any any notes that you have to Catherine Trees Catherine Trees F R I E S S Catherine are there any other individuals you can recall by name whom you uh interviewed no I would have to see the name when I look at these names I can tell you the ones that I met once that I interviewed, like Mr. Dietrich, I remember interviewing him. Uh, oh, Mr. Danks, I remember interviewing him. Uh, I remember interviewing a lady, uh, not not uh, not a significant witness, but a kind of a kind of a sad situation. Who had her son with her, who was who was suffering from a disability and felt that she had been mistreated. Now you mentioned Mr. Queen. I, I, you kind of that that one you kind of I kind of hugged her and, and apologized to her for the way she was treated, although she, she really wasn't um obviously she wasn't in the young back. Now you mentioned Mr. Queter before. Did you just spell that for the panel? Just, just hope, hope I have it right. K W E, I believe it is G E R. <clears throat> Are there any other Ju Justin? Right. Are there any other names that you can recall? If, if not, we'll move on. I just wanted to see. I remember an attorney named McBlain, because I think I knew him from before. I knew, I knew McBlain from some. I, I did. I had very close friends in Philadelphia in the bar and in politics, including several of the federal judges. So I, uh, some of the people that came up to me were members of like Republican clubs that I had spoken at the Dick Thornburg or for Carl Inspector, those of whom were political allies. Now so I campaigned for them. They campaigned. Now it was brought out last week that Mr. Hicks uh, withdrew from the uh, case on November 12th, correct? Yeah, that's the date that we figured out by process of elimination. I, I, so I prior, prior to that, I thought of it as closer in time to the actual argument by closer meeting the day before the post three days before maybe it's because everything was compressed to me. Prior to the time Mr. Hicks withdrew, were you conducting these this investigative work? Well prior to the time that Mr. Hicks withdrew, it was pretty clear that I wasn't going to have that much to do with the case, except like I was with the other cases, which is to review it to see could it fit into a group of cases that could be consolidated. It, I mean the end result was there were a group we realized after our analysis couldn't be and a group that could be and at this point at this point i was just looking for the characteristics that star and others had given me that i should be looking for and also trying to get them on paper gosh a bit if we lost some of the witness uh once mr hicks withdrew did your role uh with regard to investigation change yeah because it, in, in helping mr Hicks, as i did with the uh, with with the documents that he was doing he said it might be he said it might be helpful during even the hearing we're having on this if you come and either argue or i use you as a witness on the other possibilities of this case and how did things change and once I, he said okay let's we never got a chance to resolve. Right. So I once you don't did, think we ever resolve that, that seemed like a good idea. So once he did withdraw, how did your role change? Well, at first it was unclear what would happen if we'd have enough time to have 
First of all, would Wenda be able to argue and answer no? Wenda wasn't able to. We were able, we were able to get that recommendation pretty darn quickly. Second, can we find another lawyer? We had several recommendations. Don't think I had the time to end. I remember talking to some lawyers on the phone. I'm not sure the lawyers who were going to argue it, but the lawyers who were friends of friends who could tell you, as I'm sure. Chairman, are we on discussing this matter that is appropriate? I think we're way off base here. I just, uh, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to sort of draw a line when the investigative work stopped and when, uh, in order to help the panel understand what Mr. Giuliani's role before uh, Mr. Hicks withdrew from the case and, and after. Well, it, the testimony is tending to meander a little bit. So uh, if we could be a little more uh, precise in our answer, Mr. Giuliani, it would, it would help move things along. So, uh, so let me see if I can sum So, so the, I can, let me ask, let me see if I can. Did your investigative work or role uh, stop at the point that Mr. Hicks withdrew? No. All right. Um, well, what was your role after he withdrew in, in the case? Were you talking shortly, shortly thereafter, it's remained pretty much the same because for a period of time, I assumed we were going to get someone to take over Hicks's role. Is that could have been Kearns, could have been somebody we hired the conversations that I was talking too much about were conversations to get recommendations of someone to do that. Uh, we finally, I don't remember exactly how, we finally focused on Mr. Scorinci. I spoke to him and he was quite willing to take it on with the caveat that he, he didn't have enough time. And he said he, the judge was a very reasonable judge that there was, it was a short time period, but he, did, he could see the possibility of maybe no more than a day or two that the judge might give him. And in that case, he would be comfortable arguing the whole thing. He said, if the judge gives me a truncated period of time, then maybe you'll have to split it with me because even though you don't know the case, you know it better than I do. Um, so, Mr. Cam, Cam, as we are, we are really running far afield of what right. this a brief testimony was supposed to be about. All right. I, and anything further on the investigation that you did? No, it got resolved that I was going to argue, and I did the best I could in the 13, 14 hours that I had when it was obvious I was going to argue to get ready on that part of the case. Okay. I have no and, further, yeah, I have no further Mr. questions. <laughs> Mr. Fox? I just want to get the chronology straight. As I understand it, Mr. Giuliani, um, on the 4th, you had a meeting with former President Trump and then went to the headquarters in Virginia. Is that correct? You know, Mr. Fox, I think the election was on. Please help me again. The election was on the 3rd? Yes. Okay, yeah, it was the 4th. Yeah. Okay. And um, it, it was at the headquarters in Virginia um, where you discovered that um, um, where, where, where you be, began the process of uh, having complaints drafted in these various jurisdictions around the country? Let me, let me try this. You mentioned a moment ago a conversation with Mr. Starr um, in, in connection with the idea of a consolidated law school lawsuit. Was that while you were in uh, Virginia before you went to Philadelphia? It was either in Virginia before I went to Philadelphia or in the car as I was driving from uh, Arlington to uh, to um, uh, Philadelphia. Okay. And I think you testify that while you were in Philadelphia, there were telephone calls about the other cases that uh, you were putting together. Is that correct? Both before I left and during the, they were continuous through the day and night. Okay. So the, the concept of the consolidated lawsuit with these um, cases in other jurisdictions was reached before you went to Philadelphia, correct? The, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I would say the possibility. It wasn't it's by no means, number one, we hadn't decided we were going to do it. Number two, we didn't know if we had the facts to do it. Number three, we didn't know if it would be a good tap. I mean, 100 questions, but certainly a possibility that 
everyone that I talked to thought we should keep open. Now, uh, and 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 it was also before you went to Philadelphia that you got Mr. Hicks started on uh, preparing the case in Pennsylvania. Is that correct? Yeah, I would say, Mr. Fox, he was already started on it in some ways. Okay. Now, um, as I understood the witnesses that you personally talked to, there was Mr. Mercer, and his two draft affidavits are attached to the letter that you sent me in March of 2020, correct? I think that's right. Yeah. If you want to look at it, I'll show it to you. It's no, no, I'm, sure, I'm sure you're right about that. I just don't I don't I don't personally recollect it right now, but I'm sure you're right. And and, uh, and Mr. Queter, and that's K W E D E R. His affidavit you also sent to me in that same course. That I, I don't recall, but I'm, I'm again. I'm and with Miss Freeze, F R I E S S, who you alluded to, uh, it wasn't an affidavit, but she had some notes uh, that you also sent to me at the time. Correct? Uh, yes, sir. I did. Now, are, are there statements from any of the other witnesses that you interviewed um, that um, are included in the uh, materials that your lawyers uh, introduced uh, as Exhibit 1 in this case? I... Um... I thought there were a few. I thought there were a few others. I'm relying on. I thought maybe I put McBlaine in. P maybe Peterson. All right. Um, I, I tried to give you. I mean, I, I again numbers. The numbers are between two and three hundred, right? So I tried to give you five, six, seven representative ones picked very quickly. It probably, I shouldn't even say representative because we didn't do a particularly good job of saying, well, one for this category, one for that category. We, we gave you the ones that we could put our hands on. I think we wanted to assure you that we didn't make, <laughs> we wanted to assure you that we didn't make this stuff up. And and the last thing I wanted to ask about was, you, you said there were up to 15, um, witnesses who you found to be unreliable and who you rejected am i do i have that right yeah that's a very very rough guess okay and are these people you spoke to or are these people whose whose statements that you saw you saw both both okay uh and uh have you provided to us any of those statements from the uh people that you thought were unreliable if they were, if we had kept them in the file, you would have gotten them. I don't know. I but, seem, I seem to recall having reread in getting ready for one of these litigation the state, the big long statement from the guy that uh, had impressed me, and we spent a lot of time on that. Do you remember his name? I think it was Brown. Brown. Okay. I, I could. I. I could be wrong. That. That's all I have. Uh, I just. I just have one question, Mr. Giuliani. If you rejected uh, information from individuals, did you? Did you keep them, or did you just discard them? I gave them back. I mean, I. I. I, I I'm sorry to say, I, I can't tell you that. I gave it back to whoever gave it to me. There's only one unrelated completely to Philadelphia that uh, we kept a record of because it had national security implications and that we had an investigation done of. All the rest were the typical thing you get in these cases where somebody wants to be a witness for ego reasons or none of them seem particularly significant. I guess I thought they are going to be preserved, but I, I didn't give it a lot of the last time. Uh, and and uh, Mr. Chair, just for the record, there is an affidavit that was submitted by Ms. Freeze that sits in the record. Mr. Fox, anything else? Uh, no, nothing. Uh, Mr. Giuliani, I, I made a note of your 
as you were testifying, and I, I just wanted to get back to it. I think I think you said my notes say you said that my value was not to help Hicks work up basically work up the the Pennsylvania case. You're you were focused on systemic issues which related to the multi district litigation. Is that is that was that your testimony? Certainly up to the point where I was drafted to be the only one who would be Philadelphia. Philadelphia. At, uh, that, I, at that point, then. I had somewhere between 12 and less than 24 hours to be the complete guy for Philadelphia. And I heard that you, I heard you went to the Philadelphia Convention Center and talked to some people there. Um, but did you go to, uh, did you have any involvement in uh, Center County? No, I didn't uh, uh, go there directly. I got I, I spoke to people from there, read a lot of affidavits from there, but I didn't go. No. And uh, do you have those affidavits? Well, they're in the group of, uh, I mean, a number, I see a number of the names are from Center County. Those affidavits are from Center County. Who was, who was leading the investigation on that? Was it Hicks? No, it was a woman. Um, I'd have to go back and get her name. She's a very competent woman who was in, who was in charge of Center County. Two people. Uh, both females who were in charge of Century County, and who was in who led the investigative work for Chester County? Well, the investigators were were the same. Uh, Mike Roman was more or less the investigator for Pennsylvania, and he picked people for different counties. But I, what I'm responding to is who was in charge of the inspectors in those in those counties. I spoke to them. Uh, there were two in. Center County, there were two in Delaware County. Uh, there was uh, Ms. Freeze and a second person in charge in Allegheny County, whose affidavit is quite lengthy and supports a lot, of, corroborates a lot of what uh, Catherine Freeze. Uh, if 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 we were to, who's the who's the person who would be most knowledgeable about? The facts underlying the uh, the federal litigation would that be Mr. Hicks? Well, up to the point that uh, I guess the answer is it, it's in stages, sir. So, so. Up to the point that he left, he would be the one who'd be the most valuable. Uh, after it was after it was uh, after he left, then it would probably be a combination of me. Joe to Geneva, Vicky Tenzing, and, and Jenna Ellis, who, who uh, and, and then ultimately then Mr. Scarinci got up to the speed and he was able to take over the case. And Mr. Mr. Hicks, is he still with the Porter Wright firm? I'm not absolutely certain, sir. He's not on your witness list. Can you explain why? Uh, he, well, he didn't want to be a witness. We attempted to contact him, and he uh, did not cooperate. And I think it was the same with Mr. Fox. I think because the well, committee of 65 brought a complaint against him, and he's under a lot of our witnesses were under advice of attorneys not to uh, give any statements because of other investigations. He had a real problem. Even character witnesses have been uh, unwilling to testify because of repercussions from their law firms. So I have anything else from the panel? Yes, Mr. Bernius, I have uh, a couple of quick questions. Mr. Giuliani, um, your testimony this morning um, dealt with individuals you interviewed or spoke to about the observational boundaries or vantage point um, issues. Is that correct? Mostly, sir, uh, because that's what I thought. And they talked to me about many things, but I elected to focus on that because that, I thought that was the issue you were concerned about. Um, but the other part of your lawsuit dealt with notice and cure. Did you do any investigative work on that portion of the case? So almost an equal amount of, of um, 
statements that I were given, possibly more because they were shorter. You, you don't have the set of facts isn't as long about that. Uh, I probably spoke to as many people who said to me, um, I wasn't able to fix the ballot, but I know that uh, the people in another county did, or um, I, was to I was told that I couldn't cure the ballot, but three friends of mine said that in the Democrat county, they were willing to do it. There's testimony that uh, in general, that it was not allowed in Republican counties uh, with the reason why that the Republican uh, council had advised them that it would be a violation of the law if they uh, if they did it because the legislation hadn't properly been amended and that the action of the Secretary of State was uh, uh, extra constitutional, extra legal. So you, so you had this division between Democrat counties that were following her interpretation ignoring the fact that the statute made it illegal and the Republican counties that were taking the, let's say, stricter view that uh, the, 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 the Secretary of State doesn't have the ability to change the law under Article uh, 2, Section 2, Clause 1. Yeah, no, I understand that from... Um... Well, many people told me that, and I... I um, do you have any affidavits or documents in the really any record? They're really affidavits. They're about 22 affidavits like that among the, maybe, I gave the number during my testimony. Uh, one night in between testimony, I wouldn't count them. And uh, I, it's in the record. I, I, I picked, pulled out the affidavits among the 200 and whatever that relate to not just noticing cure, but disparate treatment between Republicans and Democrats. No, both, I understand. Both, both individually. Was that provided to Mr. Fox in the affidavits? They're in the affidavits, yes, sir. They're in, the, they're in exhibit one, plaintiff's exhibit number one. Do you recall any of the names? I could get them in a minute. I don't, I mean, I don't, I haven't, I get you some of the names. So just go. Okay. Uh, I'll check the exhibit list. Thank you, Mr. Jones. I think about, about, is it about 22? Sure. <clears throat> Two categories. One of them talked about entire counties that where Republicans were not allowed to cure, Democrats were. Some talk about individual acts where a Republican was allowed and a Democrat wasn't. <clears throat> Thank you. That's all, Mr. Burns. Merle, anything? No, not at this time. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Giuliani. You're excused. Um, thank you, sir. <clears throat> now, the, uh, the, the panel may have some follow-up uh, questions on the evidence before we, uh, before we go into executive session. Does any, any questions, Mr. Brozos, Mr. Hainsworth, Merle? Um, well, I had a question, and maybe this could be addressed in your supplemental briefs, um, but I couldn't, I'm still wrestling with the idea of the voter dilution. How was that argument reflected in any way in the relief sought? I would say that the, uh, many of the laws and decisions Oh. No, this is not, Mr. Giuliani. This is not a question addressed to you. I'm sorry. This is a this is a question addressed to your counsel. I thought you meant what I put in the complaint. I'm sorry. You want us to address that now, or do you want us? You know, I think we put some of that in our uh, legal memorandum that we had given you. No, I, I read that. I read that. It wasn't I, enough, apparently. All right, we'll have no. to do better next time. <laughs> And we will, but but basically what we're saying is that if we're not counting, uh, and we have case law in there, that if we're not counting the votes uh, of people who are not allowed to cure, then their vote was diluted in comparison to people whose vote 
was allowed to be cured. And, and I think that's clearly a, a voter dilution standing argument. Now, you had pointed out to us that maybe, you know, we, we couldn't get relief from suing the Republican counties because they were, they believe they were following the law. Now, if we were incorrect and Mr. Giuliani only heard his own client, but it's not frivolous. It's not patently frivolous. It's not a bad argument. So what is the relief that you'd be requesting for voter dilution? Well, we, we would like to find out um, in, in discovery what, who, how many ballots were allowed to be cured in the Democratic counties, particularly the seven counties. Uh, but it's, it's also, as we pointed out, an equal protection argument that even if it were done differently in, in Democrat, Republican counties, even if it was done in some Republican counties, that runs afoul of Bush v. Gore and, and, and Pierce. And one case that I can't even pronounce, but it's in there, it's a, uh, it's, I think it's a Ninth Circuit case, Chiaferos, and I can't pronounce it, but it's in our papers, <coughs> clearly a violation of equal protection. Even if they did it in some Republican counties and not in some Democratic counties, it has to be uniform. It must be uniform. Thank you. Anything else from the panel? No. Not at this, no. <clears throat> All right. Um, the, uh, the hearing committee will now Mr. Bernie, resume its executive session pursuant to board rule 11.11. .11. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Fox. I, I wanted to make one representation uh, with respect to Mr. Hicks. Uh, um, we did attempt to interview Mr. Hicks, and we spoke with the general counsel for his law firm, and their position was that Mr. Hicks's obligations, confidentiality to his clients under 1.6 refute prevented him from being able to speak with us. So it was not, they did not say that he, they refused to do <laughs> because he was under investigation or complaints have been made about him, but he thought that his uh, obligations of confidentiality and maintaining privilege uh, prevented him from um, uh, uh, assisting us in, in essence. And so the, that was the reason that we resorted to the subpoena. May, may I comment? Uh, 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 no, no. no. May, may I comment? I waive that. That's you. the client's privilege. He waived it. That's President Trump's privilege, not the law firm. Uh, um, Mr. Uh, Trump has waived privilege uh, to me to test. Sir, Mr. Bernie, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair, may I, may I comment on that? We, I personally emailed Mr. Hicks, who would not respond. I spoke to Ms. Kearns, uh, and when she heard what I wanted her to do, she said she doesn't feel comfortable talking about that. I also had contacted by email, Mr. Skarinci, no response. And I just want to point out that when I looked up, I, I had no knowledge of what had happened, but I, I saw that the committee of 65 uh, brought charges against all of them. And I, look, we're talking about inferences here, right? My inference is they did not want to talk because they were subject to a, uh, a discipline complaint by the committee of 65 in Pennsylvania. Yeah, I think now we're getting off on a little bit of a tangent. Um, no, but I wanted to respond. Okay. Um, as I was saying, the, uh, the hearing committee will now go back into executive session pursuant to board rule 11.11. .11, and I, I note again that we spent considerable time last week in executive session discussing this matter. Um, the rule provides that in relevant part, quote, at the conclusion of the evidentiary portion of the hearing, and after hearing such final argument as the hearing committee chair shall permit, the hearing committee shall go into executive session and decide preliminarily whether it finds a violation of any disciplinary rule that has been proven by disciplinary counsel. Um, because of the extensive uh, nature of our earlier deliberations, I will recess this hearing for 15 minutes until 10.10. 10.
when we will resume. If we need more time, uh, we will let we will let you know and uh, and uh, and continue the recess longer. But right now, I think uh, fifteen minutes is is a reasonable time in which we can consider the testimony we heard this morning in addition to what we discussed last week. So take a break until 10, 10. Thank you. Oh, opening up the breakout rooms now. Thank you. Thank you.
Hey, Barry and John. Um, well, I'll, I'll talk. I'll, I'll talk to you off the record later. Okay. We've looked into the the pleadings that he requested, and there are a lot of them. Um, All right, we can talk later, I guess. Uh, this is the reporter. I'm here. Yes. Yeah. All right, we're back in session. Oh, yes. Pursuant to Board Rule 11.11, .11, the hearing committee has convened an executive session to conclude our preliminary consideration of this matter in light of this morning's testimony. We, came, we began our deliberations immediately after closing arguments last week and have considered the evidence presented during the hearing, including that presented this morning, the party's closing arguments and their written submissions. Based on our consideration of the record, we have made a preliminary non-binding non determination that disciplinary counsel has proved at least one of the charged rules violations by clear and convincing evidence. I must emphasize that under board rule 11.11, .11, this decision is preliminary and it is not binding. This is not the final decision of the hearing committee. Following the conclusion of the hearing, we will ask the parties to submit post-hearing briefs, and we will then prepare a report and recommendation, which we will file with the board on professional responsibility. Board Rule 11.11 .11 also provides that in all cases in which the hearing committee is able to reach such a preliminary non-binding determination, the hearing committee shall immediately resume the hearing and permit disciplinary counsel to present evidence of prior discipline if a respondent shall be permitted to present any additional evidence in mitigation. We will turn to that now. Mr. Fox, do you have anything to offer at this point? I do not. Excuse me, Mr. Chair, before we go into the mitigation, I just have a question. Uh, would we be permitted at this point? Uh, I know it's preliminarily, but you mentioned that one of the charges has been, uh, at least one of the charges has been proven. Uh, are we entitled to know which, that, what that charge is? No, uh, the, the board has been clear on that, that we, because it's preliminary, because it's not binding, it's not uh, required, nor is it appropriate for dis us to discuss that at this time. How can we respond? Now, uh, Mr. Mr. Fox has nothing. Mr. Cammons, do you have anything to offer in mitigation of sanction? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair. We, <laughs> Mr. Chair, we would call on Mr. Robert Costello. I, I think he's in the waiting room. No uh, one is in the waiting room at this time. Well, we're just on the phone. We're, we're just on the phone, and he used the link uh, we had sent him last week. I don't know if he went onto the link yet. Let me, let me, let me, can I call him quickly? Well, in the meantime, uh, I wanted to offer additional mitigation through Mr. Giuliani. Uh, we would offer, of course, the testimony that he gave last week in connection with his public service. We're not, I would not have him go through that again. I would offer that portion of the record uh, as mitigation. Would that be acceptable? Yes. All right. In addition to that, I just have a few questions of you. Few brief questions of Mr. Giuliani. Um, if I can proceed, yes, you may. All right, Mr. Giuliani. Uh, last week you described uh, your years of public service. Uh, in addition to that, have you been responsible for founding any charitable organizations? Uh, I was. Uh, wouldn't say I founded, but I was very helpful in putting together. Well, yes, I was. I did find. Uh, an organization uh, known known as the uh, Twin Towers Fund that was set up several days after September 11. I was the I was the head of it. I, I don't remember exactly. I guess I was the CEO or the chairman. Or someone else was the CEO, and I raised I I I, I um, started that organization for the specific purpose of making sure that my firefighters and police officers who died on September 11, that their families would never have to worry about 
uh, educating their children or taking care of their children or would never want for physical things because there was nothing else I could do for them. Um, we did that for other police officers that died um, very often when the city, uh, while I was mayor, approximately 52 police officers were killed in the line of duty and 48 uh, um, <coughs> firefighters and a, a number of sanitation workers and uh, teachers. And as to each one of them, I always set up a fund in addition to the city's uh, funds, which, which were, believe it or not, more substantial than the federal government provides for soldiers, which shocked me. In addition to the Twin Tower fund. We raised, so we raised, uh, we raised 200 and, excuse me if I have the numbers slightly off, we raised about $220 million. We distributed every penny to the widows, the orphans, the grandparents. Uh, we spent no money on administration with the exception of the money for an accountant, which you have to spend on administration under New York law because if you don't, then it's considered a conflict of interest. The rest of the administrative money, uh, we didn't spend because I got people to donate their time or I got them to contribute specifically to pay the administrative bill of a lawyer who had to review something or a, a person who had to build a building. Sorry, because I wanted to make sure that I could say to you, if you give me, if you give me uh, $5,000, every penny goes to uh, goes to the to, to the to the widows. The second organization I was very involved with was established at or about the same time. And it, it oh, and that organization I started and I concluded it in three years when all the money was distributed. It was put through a hellish order by by Mr. Spitzer before he became. You're talking about the Twin Tower. Yeah, and it was found. To, it was found to have uh, wasted no no money at all, which he was reluctant to put out, but he did. And what was the second? The uh, second one was the Twin Tower Fund. The Twin Tower I Fund. Mean, you about oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Tunnel to Towers. Uh, Tunnel to Towers was established three or four days after the attack by a family, an extraordinary family known as the Siller family. Stephen Siller was a New York City firefighter, 29 years old, lived in Brooklyn. Uh, on the day that that happened, he was off duty going to play golf with his brother, Frank. And instead of playing golf, he canceled it. Uh, he kissed his four children at home goodbye who were all watching television. He ran to his firehouse, which was four blocks away. He broke into his firehouse. He took out his bunker gear, which weighs about 70 pounds. He put it on his back. And he ran through the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. He ran through the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel to the Twin Towers, ran into the Twin Towers, has been documented as having saved approximately 13 people who have given testimony about that. Thereafter, we lost track of him and he died. The Silla family, several days after, decided to start a run through the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel in memory of what their brother Stephen did to raise money for the same purpose, to, to give to the families, to the firefighters, the police officers, the rescue workers, the construction workers, et cetera. Uh, I um, had to give them permission to do that. At first, I was reluctant to do it because the FBI and the CIA wanted that tunnel to be just for them so that they could move very, very important material. This is no longer uh, classified information. But one of the buildings that went down was a CIA special site. So it had to be guarded very carefully for, for a month. And it led to a lot of the conspiracy, the absurd conspiracy theories. But in any, in any event, uh, we started that. I have been involved in it from, de from de day one on the board. I chair their golf tournament. I chair their dinners. I, um, go to their events, I sat down with major donors and helped raise three million and five million and eight million. 
The long and short of it is after they took care of the needs of all of the firefighters and police officers, they expanded to taking care of the needs of firefighters, police officers, and military people who die in the line of duty. They, they pay the mortgage on the home immediately. Uh, they also help them with getting the children through school. They're with them for the rest of their lives with help. And then for catastrophically injured warriors, because in the wars we fight now, less people die, but more people are seriously injured and live. They build smart homes. They build homes so that you can have a maximum degree of independence. Uh, and they're, it's a wonderful thing to, to, to see. I believe they've done over 100 of these homes. They're on schedule to do 1,000. And they uh, have a program that you may have seen on television. They ask you to put in $11 a month uh, so that you will build these homes for paraplegic and catastrophically injured uh, warriors. Uh, just this morning, I was late coming here because we had a telethon for them to raise money with Frank Siller, who is the person who runs it. Um, so I feel I have an obligation anytime he asks me or anybody else having to do with September 11th to do whatever I can do to, 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 uh, to help them. I, help, I also help out with a lot of Catholic charities and sports charities. And, but those are the two that I devote the most of my time to. I read, I read um, the night before Christmas to the uh, foster children at Hale House every year. I've done it for 27 years. And I <laughs> dress up as Santa Claus. All right, thank you. Uh, that concludes that, that portion of uh, Mr. Giuliani's testimonies. We'd now like, is, is Mr. Costello in the waiting room? He is. Right, could you please let him in? Yes, letting him in now. Mr. Costello, can you um, start your camera? I'll try calling. Okay. So I'll connect you. You're done. I'm done. I'll touch it. Okay. You have to turn on your camera and your voice. Un unmute, unmute, unmute yourself and turn on and turn on your camera. Oh well, no, we can't see you. So aren't you? Yeah. I just sent him a prompt to start his camera. Thank you. She sent you a prompt to start your camera. Got it. Got it. I don't see any other prompt. Too, yeah, don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put your camera on. Just, you <laughs> if you tell me how to do it, I'll be happy to do it. Start video. Yes, start video. Click that. You got it. Do you see it yet? Nope, not yet. We can hear you, uh, Mr. President. Okay, but I'm, I'm, they, I'm oh, you're. It looks like a black screen just appeared. Do you have something covering your camera on your computer? You're talking to me? Uh, yes. No, I see a black screen also. Um, your camera, is it extended? My camera is attached to the computer. And you don't have anything covering the top of it? I do not, no. And it worked yesterday on a different Zoom. Am I supposed to click on select a camera, Microsoft oh. camera front, Cybertrack, H5? Which one do you want me to check? Oh, maybe it should do the first one and see what happens. It's on the first one. Okay, maybe choose the next one, see what happens. Oh boy, Cybertrack 5. 
There and, we go. Now know, we can see you. Cybertrack 5. That's thank the correct you. answer. Thank you, Ms. Barrazas. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the assistance. Oh, there he is. Oh, I think you muted, Mr. Mr. Bernius. <laughs> what? Sorry, good morning, Mr. Costello. Good Do you morning. swear or affirm that the testimony you give in this matter will be the, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Absolutely, yes. You may proceed, Mr. Cabins. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Costello, you're currently practicing law? I am. Where are you admitted to practice? Um, I'm admitted to practice in the state of New York, the Southern District of New York, the Eastern District of New York, and the United States Supreme Court. And are you currently employed? I am. And where are you employed? I'm a partner at Davidoff, Hutcher, and Citron at uh, 630 3rd Avenue, New York, New York. And what type of practice are you engaged in? I do civil and criminal litigation. The criminal litigation is limited to white collar investigations, that type of material. And prior to your uh, practice, your private practice, did you serve uh, in public service? I did. I was an assistant United States attorney in the Southern District of New York and uh, deputy chief of the criminal division of that office. Uh, and what types of cases? Just as a little anecdote before that, um, in between my second and third year of law school, I was a student assistant in the United States Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York, where I worked directly with uh, Rudy Giuliani. Uh, that's what I was getting to. So you, you know Mr. Giuliani? For 51 years. And uh, tell us again, how did you meet him? Uh, when I took a job as a student assistant in the you know, United States Attorney's Office, during the summer between my second and third year of law school, the assistant U.S. attorney that I was assigned to was Rudolph W. Giuliani, who at the time had a full head of hair and a mustache. But I still recognize him. <laughs> uh, and since that time, have you maintained a relationship with Mr. Giuliani? I have, absolutely. And uh, uh, for the last three years, I've been representing Mr. Giuliani in connection with an investigation uh, in the Southern District of New York into uh, alleged FARA, Foreign Agent Registration Act violations, which turned out to be absolutely nothing. Uh, two or three weeks ago, the United States Attorney's Office, breaking with tradition, issued a public statement saying that they were not bringing any charges uh, against Mr. Giuliani. And this is after we had reviewed, or at least I had reviewed every email and text message written on any of his electronic devices for the past 20 years. You, you personally reviewed those, that information? I did. My assignment was we had a special master in that case because Mr. Giuliani was not only a lawyer, but the uh, personal counsel to the president of the United States. The U.S. Attorney's Office uh, initiated the move for a special master so that we could review privileged documents and make claims of privilege. That meant that every single piece of electronic evidence was delivered to the special master who delivered it to me to decide whether we were gonna claim uh, executive privilege, attorney client privilege, work product privilege, et cetera. And uh, then the special master would make a ruling. And if we disagreed, uh, the district judge would then be the decider of that. But we never needed to go to the district judge. We agreed on virtually everything. All right. But in the process, I had to review every single email and text message way outside of the scope of the criminal investigation. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know anybody that could stand up to that kind of scrutiny. I literally have seen Mr. Giuliani's electronic soul. <laughs> now, Mr. Costello, based on your 50 or more than 50 year relationship with Mr. Giuliani, have you formed an opinion as to the character of Mr. Giuliani? Absolutely, he's one of the finest individuals uh, I've had the pleasure to meet in my life. Um, I know this guy probably better than himself actually, because I saw him practicing when he was an, an unknown assistant US attorney. And by the way, during his career, he never lost the case as an assistant US attorney. And I think everybody knows his record as the United States Attorney for the Southern District of New York. Uh, this is an extraordinary guy, an extraordinary lawyer who really 
his inner soul believes in winning. He doesn't take chances in cases. This, the thought that this guy would file a frivolous lawsuit is just unimaginable to me because Rudy Giuliani is smart enough to know that a frivolous lawsuit is going to result in, at the very least, in a loss, and he doesn't like to lose. And uh, it's, it could result in a situation that he's in right now. So there's not a chance in the world that this guy would have knowingly filed a frivolous lawsuit. He was in charge of seven, I think, or eight state litigations at the same time. Um, and so he had to rely on other people, other um, lawyers who were practiced in the art of election law, uh, which is certainly not Mr. Giuliani's specialty. He has a lot more knowledge about that than I certainly do. But uh, there isn't a chance in the world, uh, I would stake my life on that, that he wouldn't file a frivolous lawsuit knowingly. I have nothing further, Mr. Burns. No questions. Mr. Fox? No questions. Thank you, Mr. Scostello. Thank you. Thank you all. Mr. Commons, anything else? No, nothing further. Uh, no, no further mitigation. Okay. Thank you. The, uh, with the exception of the supplementation of the record with the district court uh, filings that we discussed earlier, the the, uh, the the case is closed. The trade the uh, hearing is completed. Um, I think it would it would be productive at this point, though, if we had some oral argument on the issue of sanction. Um, if I experience, um, assuming we find a violation after the filing of the briefs and proposed findings of fact, assuming we reach that point, we have to make a recommendation on sanction, which is often one of the most difficult decisions um, a hearing committee or indeed the board can make. So I'd like to hear uh, first Mr. Fox and, uh, and then responded as to what their recommendations are as to sanction in this case. Um, first, Mr. Fox, do you have any uh, comments? Yes. Um... As I'm, as I know, you know very well, Mr. Bernius. There's a, a substantial case law uh, about uh, how the hearing committee and ultimately the court reaches sanction in these cases. The so-called five factors. The notion that uh, the sanction should be consistent with um, sanctions imposed in other similar cases. But I believe that in this situation, um, that that case law is irrelevant. I said, I think, in the my initial argument in this case, that what Mr. Giuliani did was use his law license uh, to undermine the legitimacy of a presidential election. And by doing so, to undermine the basic premise of the democratic system that we all live in, enshrined in our constitution, which is that when an election is over and the results are determined, the losers concede and the winner governs principle that was established in 1800, as I said, I think, in my opening statement as well. When we didn't have political parties in those days, they called them factions. But when John Adams was defeated in his efforts to get a second term, there was at the time considerable apprehension as to what would happen. Remember, this was a very new system of government. Benjamin Franklin famously said uh, at the conclusion of the Constitution of the Convention, it's a republic if you can keep it. And there was a question as to whether we could keep it. And Adams established that we could by going back to Massachusetts and retiring and allowing Jefferson to become president. That principle has endured in the United States ever since. In 1865, 1861, obviously, some uh, states did not want to acknowledge 
or did, did not want to continue in the Union. But even then, I don't think the challenge to Lincoln's presidency was that he hadn't been elected. The challenge was they wouldn't, uh, the Southern states would not live with it. And I guess the closest we came after that was maybe was the Hayes Tilden election and the famous Wormley House deal, which to our shame, um, uh, ended Reconstruction. But in all those cases, the losing candidate and his supporters conceded, and they did not do what Mr. Giuliani did. Mr. Giuliani has testified um, on several occasions that he believes there was a conspiracy. Well, there was a conspiracy, and he was the head of it. I'm not saying it was a criminal conspiracy, but it was certainly a civil conspiracy. And the conspiracy was he left the White House on January on, on November 4 and immediately determined that they were going to challenge the results of this election before they had any evidence. It's not on the record. They went, you know, he testified, he reiterated it today. They were going to put together some kind of national challenge in multiple states. It was shoot first ask questions later. Lawyers can't do that, but in the context in which Mr. Giuliani did it, it was the most serious violation of Rule 3.1 that this country is ever going to experience, I hope. And so I think this case, the seriousness of the misconduct calls for only one sanction, and that is a sanction of disbarment. Mr. Fox, let me ask you first, is there is there any Pennsylvania law that that uh, deals with sanction and three point and rule three point one violations? Uh, Mr. Bernice, I don't know off the top of my head, but I will tell you this. Uh, the case law in the District of Columbia is that even though you are applying the uh, substantive law of the state in which the uh, misconduct occurred that you apply the uh, sanction rules of the District of Columbia. Uh, we'll, we'll provide you cases on that uh, at the appropriate. Mm -hmm. But so I think the DC uh, sanction law is the one that's appropriate. Are you are you suggesting that we should disregard the five or six factor test that's been laid out by the Court of Appeals? I don't know that I would use the word disregard as much as I would say that the first of those factors, the nature of the misconduct, in this case is so overwhelming that the other factors are, I believe, irrelevant. And that, I don't think we're in a position to ignore the, the test. I mean, I think whatever sanction we apply has to be consistent with the application of the test that the Court of Appeals has uh, has articulated. Well, I understand that. And, uh, and, and what I've just suggested to you, I think, is a way to harmonize the, um, the recommendation with that. But you've, but got, recommendation. You've, got some, you've got some problems, though, don't you? I mean, in, the, in terms of the comparability, the the uh, probably the most egregious case that I'm aware of in in terms of 3.1 is Pearson, which was uh, which was a lawsuit that uh, brought over the alleged loss of a pair of pants and the damages were 62 million dollars. That was a pretty extreme claim, and this and the sanction was 90 days. So from 90 days to disbarment is quite a leap, isn't it? I I I. Uh, I agree with you 100%, but I don't think that the comparison of uh, the an extremely frivolous complaint over a pair of pants uh, against a, a dry cleaner compares with violating the basic oath that we all take to support the Constitution. That's what every DC lawyer says. And to try to undermine the legitimacy of the election. And look, I mean, you, you're, you, you cannot be oblivious to what has gone on in this country since November 3rd of 2020. And the harm 
that Mr. Giuliani initiated, which is a is part of a continuum. It goes from filing lawsuits that are are, are all unsuccessful to you know efforts to get the vice president not to certify the results of the election to what we well, well, we're getting a little beyond the record here though right i mean that's i don't think, well, i don't think it's beyond the record uh, uh to you know to to look at the events that everybody in this country knows occurred and uh this was part of a continuum i i think it was a harm a fundamental harm to the fabric of the country that, that could well be irreparable, but it certainly is something that 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 the court, that this hearing committee, the board, and ultimately the court, ought to say, cannot be tolerated. That certainly in the future, no any lawyer that engages in this kind of misconduct, harming the country as this has done, has at least got to realize that his or her law license is at risk. And yes, it's unprecedented, but I think the harm that was done is unprecedented. I've, you know, been involved in the disciplinary system for 35 years, maybe. And um, I, I can't think of another case that approaches this in terms of the seriousness of the misconduct. So it, it, it is my position, and I'm going to adhere to this position. You may, you obviously may not agree with it, uh, but it is my position that the only the only rem the sanction that's appropriate for this kind of misconduct is disbarment. How do uh, one of the other factors that we have to take into account is um, is is mitigation uh, evidence, and and on that there's seems to be a um, you know a, a fair amount that has been testified to in terms of Mr. Giuliani's. Um, Conduct, although uh, most of it appears to be quite some time ago, is that how do you factor that into your recommendation? Look, Mr. Giuliani, und I mean, you know, Mr. Giuliani's service as the United States Attorney and his service as the mayor is uh, is not without criticism. But, um, th there is no question that his conduct. Uh, in the wake of the events of 9-11 of, uh, was admirable, more than admirable. But as you said, that was 20 years ago. And I don't know whether something's happened to Mr. Giuliani in the interim uh, I, or, or what. But, you know, it's like there's two different people. There's the person who responded in a way that very few people could respond uh, uh, to 9-11 and showed remarkable leadership at that time. And there's a person who, undermine, who attempted to undermine the legitimacy of a presidential election without a basis to do so. And I don't think that... We, don't, we would object, Mr. Chair, we don't object to this discussion. Uh, it's not part of the record. and. Uh, we think it's inappropriate. Overall. And, and I don't think that that prior service justifies imposing a sanction lesser than disbarment for this extraordinary misconduct in which he engaged. Anything else, Mr. Fox? No, sir. Uh, Mr. Bernius, I have a question for Mr. Fox. Um, in the, the discussion, uh, you laid out a litany where there was a peaceful transfer of power uh, throughout American history. And what I am struggling with is, um, is anytime there's a challenge to an election that is unsuccessful. This makes it clear. I had nothing to do with that. Mr. Giuliani, can you put yourself on mute, please? Um, would that constitute sanctionable activity if it's unsuccessful? No, sir. Uh, I mean, look, let's go to Bush v. Gore. Uh, Bush v. Gore uh, was a state 
election challenge. Um, in an election that was decided, I my recollection was less than 500 votes statewide. Um, and there was uh, a legitimate election challenge that was filed. And I there, there, there's nothing wrong with that. And if, let's take Pennsylvania, for example, 80,000 votes is a lot to overcome. But Pennsylvania's got, um, you know, provisions and, and laws for if states run the elections. File an election challenge if you've got a basis to do so. I, you know, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But that wasn't what they did. They, they fought a civil rights action in federal court. And I believe all of the actions that were filed nationwide and Mr. Giuliani headed up were, were, were similarly filed in federal court. They weren't election challenges to close elections. I mean, that's perfectly legitimate. But that wasn't what they did. And, um, and, and it was a coordinated effort to undermine the legitimacy of the election. And if, 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 if we don't believe in elections in this country, we've lost our democracy. And that is what they he attempted to do. And it is not an election contest. That I have no problem with that. Thank you. Mr. Cummins or Mr. Leventhal? I, I will uh, take the lead on this, if I may, uh, Mr. Bernius. Number one, Mr. Giuliani has totally cooperated in the DC Council's investigation. He has met, he's agreed to meet with Mr. Bern, uh, Mr. Fox on a video Zoom to explain his position earlier. It's evidenced by our two of our submissions that uh, Mr. Cammons and I have submitted, which is in the record in our, <clears throat> in our exhibits. So, uh, so we just want to know, let you know that he's absolutely cooperated. We want the panel to know that this truncated time frame where everything had to be decided by November 23rd for the certification of Pennsylvania, that he relied on others, including Mr. Hicks, who argued the Pierce case, which had a, an equal protection argument that was relied on here and which we relied on amongst other cases. He relied on others to file the initial lawsuit. His contribution was that this occurred in other states. The fact that other lawyers left the case, I don't want to go into detail, but you can look at Judge Braun's introduction. Um, he noted that attorneys for the plaintiffs both appeared and withdrew within 72 hours. Both withdrawals came because of pressure from their firms and external threats against the lawyers personally. On November 9th, the complaint was filed, as you know, by Hicks and McGee. On November 12th, they moved to withdraw and two Texas attorneys came in as co-counsel the Kearns. On November 13th, the Third Circuit just issued its Bonet decision, which was cert was applied for shortly thereafter. On November 15th, Kearns and Scott, without Mr. Giuliani's uh, filed the first, uh, filed the amended complaint. On November 16th, defendants filed a motion to dismiss. Later that evening, Kearns, along with Scott and Hughes, moved to withdraw from litigation. This withdrawal, like the earlier litigation, was occasioned by pressure from their law firms, as well as personal threats against the lawyers. As Mr. As they had only been in the case for 72 hours, Judge Brand let them withdraw, but kept Kearns in the case so that there'd be continuity and that she can answer questions. Oral argument was scheduled for the next day on November 17th, and Judge Brand wanted to have someone to be able to answer the questions. On the 16th, Scrimmins, entered his notice of appearance and asked for more time. He planned to argue this case. He wasn't given more time, so Mr. Julie 
Giuliani stepped in the lurch. So he faced with the attrition of counsel, who would argue the case, made an application to appear pro hack vice, and the court accepted that. If you also look at Judge Brand's colloquy with the attorneys, it doesn't appear that he was going to sanction Mr. Giuliani, even though he could have. Now, let's take politics out of this equation and let's treat Mr. Giuliani like any other attorney, as Mr. Bernie has said with the five factors. That case with a $92 million lawsuit over a pair of pants, where he, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, there was $19,000 or $30,000 for car fare, uh, uh, car service to go to another dry cleaner, emotional distress, and it was a 90-day suspension. Why disregard the, the precedent in this case? Why not treat Mr. Giuliani like any other lawyer? His mitigation, his long service to this country, both as the third highest ranking person in the Attorney General's office, as the US Attorney for the Southern District of New York where he prosecuted numerous financial misconduct cases, as well as organized crime cases, breaking up the five families in New York. His charitable contributions that continue now in the wake of 9-11. This politics is not in the record. One federal judge has absolved him from anything regarding January 6th in this case. This is not about politics. In fact, this would chill any advocacy. And this is, Mr. Mr. Fox is asking us to take politics. We should take this out of the equation. Judge him like any other attorney. So we believe that in light of the preliminary finding, not a final recommendation, that there was clear and convincing evidence that Mr. Giuliani might have violated a, one of the rules in at least one aspect of this litigation. Although we do obviously take issue with that. We feel that assuming arguendo, this would be the final, we believe the least serious discipline should be imposed. Otherwise you're gonna chill effective advocacy in the future. And politics should not pay, play any part, we hope, and we trust in this committee's final recommendation. What's your view of the appropriate sanction? At least a letter, a, a letter of reprimand or, or a private admonition. So he, he should not be sanctioned as harshly as, harshly as somebody who sued a dry cleaner over a lost pair of pants? Well, but he didn't just sue a dry cleaner. He asked for $92 million uh, in, dam in damages. Mr. Giuliani didn't look. So this, it's case, a, so this case was denied. This, this case was over very quickly. It went to the appeal court uh, a couple of days later, and he didn't pursue it after that. Roy, Roy Pearson was sanctioned, suspended for 90 days. Correct. Because of his excess, the, essentially because of the excessive remedy that he sought. He sought incredible money damages for that were way out of whack with the loss of a pair of pants. So how, how, respond to Mr. Fox's argument that really what's going on here is uh, he's seeking sanction based on the extraordinary remedy that was sought by Mr. Giuliani in that litigation, which have, would have disrupted our entire society. How do you 
Isn't I, I don't, that more significant than a simple money damages claim? I, I don't want to be repetitive, but I think I pointed out earlier in this case that it is in the uh, request for preliminary or temporary restraining order, it was just sought to keep the status quo. Don't certify the election until a hearing can be held. And where he would try and attempt to prove uh, the allegations made on the due process, the equal protection argument. And if that were sustained, uh, as I pointed out in the legal memorandum that I submitted, in the Wisconsin Supreme Court case, uh, four judges said that the remedy requested was too drastic, and three judges in the minority pointed out in a footnote that asking for such further and equitable relief that anything was possible, including maybe a new election, if he proved it. So he didn't ask for anything drastic in the, in the temporary restraining order. He basically asked for relief if everything was proven. So he didn't, he didn't ask to stop everything, turn the election over to uh, Mr. Trump. He asked for keeping the status quo until the hearing could be held. Now, I know I said that before, but I'm saying it again. Thank you, Mr. Leventhal. Mr. Fox, anything else? No, I have nothing at this point in time. Something from the higher, uh, oh, oh, can, I, can I have a moment, please, to confer with my client? I'm going to take my microphone off. Certainly. Uh, could you help us take Here. the microphone for a second? Um, yes, there's one more thing I, I'd like to state. Nowhere in the charges does it charge Mr. Giuliani with undermining uh, democracy, uh, uh, with uh, destroying uh, democracy. And I think it's a little unfair to, for that to be a, a factor in your calculus of the appropriate sanction. If anything, um, federal judge has found on the Iqbal Twombly, which Mr. Mr. Uh, Fox is relying on, in Bernie Thompson versus Trump, that uh, any claim against Mr. Giuliani does not cross the line from conceivable to plausible as a uh, conspirator. So look, we didn't bring that in. They should not be able to bring, uh, to bring that in. It's irrelevant to this determination on sanction. And I think Mr. Mr. Fox is trying to sway the, 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 pan the panel for a more harsh, sanction by bringing in this background, this noise that is not in the complaint or the record. How about that, Mr. Fox? What do you have to say to that? 
the notion that this is politics and that we should ignore what is going on in this country is to me blinks reality. I mean, contradicts what he said. This case is not motivated by politics in the sense of, it, well, uh, the basic problem, I think, with uh, with what Mr. Giuliani did was the notion that politics means anything goes. It, even when Mr. Leventhal was describing uh, the situation a moment ago, there was a sort of an assumption, well, this lawsuit is going to be brought and Mr. Giuliani comes in at the last minute. No, lawsuits asking courts to deprive voters of the right to vote th those are not that's not common politics in this country this is not politics they, they they're, they're they're trying to ignore the will of the voters they're trying openly to ask a judge to disqualify 600 at minimum 680,000 voters with a notion that anything goes it's just politics Anything goes, you just got to win. Rip my apartment apart. My and apartment. that is something that somebody has to put a stop to. And if you want to take a blinded view and compare this to a guy who filed a frivolous lawsuit about a pair of pants, you can obviously do that. But I think that the court ultimately ought to say, not that we're trying to, uh, uh, I, I forget the word that Mr. Levin, uh, Leventhal used, uh, chill advocacy, I think he said, but we are trying to deter. That's uh, the business that I'm in, is deterrence. We are trying to deter people from engaging this kind of misconduct. And this misconduct was so serious that it should never be allowed to happen again. And I don't know if we can prevent it, but the one thing we can do to, to try to deter it is to impose the most serious sanction that can be imposed. It's not politics. It's what, you know, it, 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 it is part of our duty as lawyers to make sure that people don't use their law licenses to undermine the Constitution of the United States. And disbarment is the only sanction for that. Okay, thank you. Um, May I say, say one thing, Mr. Bernie? This is not in the record. Everything he said about uh, they was going to bring a lawsuit before he found anything, uh, any uh, uh, declarations, affidavits, any theory, not in the record. That is Mr. Fox's conclusion. Not in the record. That's argument. No, no evidence to that. Okay, thank you. I, I Well, as to the last point... Um, yeah. We will be able to figure that out because the next step is, as you know, we've made our preliminary decision. Uh, we will make a final decision after the parties file findings of fact, proposed findings of fact, and conclusions of law. And uh, I'm not sure if the transcript has come out yet, but no. and we will issue an order to this effect. But for the basically for the benefit of respondents mostly, uh, responded mostly because. You, uh, you haven't, I, I don't think you've been involved in the system before. Um, the, the, uh, the filings are kind of like summary judgment filings. The findings of fact, proposed findings of fact, are to be supported by specific references to the record. Uh, disciplinary counsel is gonna do that and then respondent will reply. And they, you, you have to respond directly to each of the allegated, the alleged facts citing your own, if you disagree, you cite your own uh, uh, record evidence. Uh, they're accompanied by a uh, conclusions of law and both of uh, Mr. Cabas and Mr. Mr. Leventhal um, were uh, uh, judges. And, and so what I'm gonna say probably will resonate with them, less is more. <laughs> um, the, uh, the tighter the writing, the better. And uh, we'll, there'll be a page limit, uh, but that doesn't mean that you have to achieve it. Uh, so the uh, overall, I think the calendar will be 30 days after the transcript for disciplinary council. 
30 days uh, for respondents, uh, respondent to reply, and then uh, another 15 days for disciplinary counsel to reply. Um, and these dates are will be pretty uh, pretty cemented in because the rules uh, mandate that the hearing committee uh, issue its report and recommendation within a within a deadline. So the, basically, the the more time we give you, we take time away from ourselves, and that's an unhappy prospect. Uh, so any any comments or questions, uh, Mr. Bernius? Um, actually. The, my, the comment I'm going to make may be irrelevant in light of if, if, if you really meant to say 30 days, 30 days and 15, because normally it's it's 10 business days, 10 business days and five. That would have given me a huge problem because I have I'm scheduled to try Mr. Clark on January 9 um, and uh, that which would have been right in the middle. I could do 30 uh, and, 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 and that may, case may not go. He is doing everything in his power to delay it, uh, including removing these the disciplinary proceedings to federal court. Uh, so I don't know whether it'll go on those times, uh, it, but if it is 30, 30 and 15, I, I can, I won't have a problem with that. I would have a problem with a shorter schedule. Um, but if, if that's what you, if you meant what you said, then I'm fine. I, I meant what I said, Mr. Fox. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Chair, I just have one question. Do we do we put on our own findings of fact, or do we just respond to uh, Mr. Fox's? Both, both, both. Okay. Well, Mr. Chairman, I I would like to personally object to Mr. Fox's attack on me as having uh, tried to undermine American democracy when there is not a single fact in the record to support that argument. He raised no such argument to give us a chance to rebut it during the case. It is a typical, unethical, cheap attack, not supported by anything in the record, far more so than anything I allege that you are questioning. What I allege is supported by documents in the record. I didn't make any of it up. His arguments about democracy presume that I did not have a good faith belief that there were irregularities in the election and that the election might very well have been stolen. That belief was based on not just the 250 affidavits in this case, but the thousand affidavits I have in other cases, as well as tests, movies, 2,000 mules, uh, a report of a Supreme Court justice of the state of, of uh, Wisconsin, I have, I have two rooms filled with documents supporting my conclusion. Now, you're entitled to two points of view in America. It is a terrible attack on democracy to unfairly attack an election. It's an even worse attack on democracy to allow an election to be stolen and not respond to it. And there is enough of a basis to make that argument so that those of us who believe that aren't persecuted I've been investigated by the FBI. The investigation began the day that I represented Donald Trump. They took my iPhone cloud the day that I represented Donald Trump. You're all lawyers. That never happened to you. They alleged probable cause that I committed a crime in order to get that three years ago. A month ago, they candidly admitted there was no probable cause to indict me after three and a half years of investigation. They took every communication of mine, every bank record of mine going back 20 years. They interviewed all of my clients and deprived me of a $6 million law practice in so doing. They raided my law office. In my 17 years in the Justice Department, I never raided a law office even those representing terrorists and organized criminals. They found nothing in that. They found no crime, no misdemeanor, nothing. They haven't apologized. They haven't offered to compensate me for the tremendous damage they did. And the, and the, and the fact is that it's the same basis that they use. It's the basis that Mr. Fox is using. 
the unwillingness to admit that there may be another side to this game. I'm unfortunately the lawyer who has to represent the fact that there is another side to this game. And the fact that you advocate that side of the case does not make you a traitor. It doesn't make you any more, any, any more dedicated to democracy than Mr. Fox is. And I'll put my work to democracy. I'll put my life at risk and the times that I did it for democracy up against Mr. Fox and anyone else. And for that man to engage in that kind of a personal attack when there was no record of that, and for you to allow him to do that, I consider to be an outrage. And I am personally offended by it. And I, I, I don't know what has happened to the defense of lawyers who take on unpopular causes, because that is exactly what I did. And I have more than a basis for three quarters of the cases that come into your purview for bringing this case. It just happens to be that my side of it is politically incorrect. Thank you, All right. Thank you Mr. Chair. Thank you, unless there's anything else, we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.